All right, we've just covered point defects. Those are defects that happen at a single spot, right, in space. Well, it's also possible to have a defect that continues along a line, right, in one dimension. So let's see if we can see one of those. Take a look at this picture of what's called a, a bubble raft, right? Uh, back in the 50s and 60s, before they had microscopes that could look at individual atoms, this was sort of the tool that they had. They could make bubbles, and then they'd simulate these as acting sort of like atoms. Well, the first thing is, there is a point defect here. Do you see it? A point defect is a single missing atom or an additional interstitial atom, right? I see one right there, right? See that missing atom? Now, you might have said that it was this one, but if you look closer, there's something else going wrong with this lattice. Let's start by drawing lines of continuous atoms. Do you see the problem here? In this lattice that was otherwise pretty normal and looked sort of like a hexagonal arrangement of bubbles, it's almost as if they stuffed in an extra half row of atoms in there. That's what we call a dislocation. This is an edge dislocation is the specific type that it is. Now, there's something that we can do. We can do something called the Berger circuit. So we can basically, we're going to trace around this dislocation and find out what's the dislocation. So. Let's start by picking a direction. Let's go this way. We're going to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. You could do a different number. Let's do 5, though. Then we're going to do 5 in another direction. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 1, 2, 3, 4. And look where we end up. In order to finish this back to the point where we started, we have to go over, right? That's called the Berger's vector. The Berger's vector, when you do a loop around your dislocation, we did it with sets of five, but we could have done it in a smaller number as well. The difference between the starting point and your end point is your Berger's vector, right? So you can see this here. Here they did a Berger's vector around the dislocation. Sure enough, you can see they did two, 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 but you had to do that extra one to get back where you started. Okay, now I said that this type of dislocation with the extra half row stuffed in like that is called an edge dislocation. There are other types of dislocations, right? So edge dislocation and screw dislocation. Here's the one that we just saw. You can see that it has this extra half row of atoms stuffed into the lattice right there, right? The other one looks a little bit different. You start out with a regular material and then you sheared it, right? Such that now the Berger's vector is pointing up and down, right? That's your Berger's vector. Whereas here, your Berger's vector, the difference was in this direction. So that's the fundamental difference between what's called an edge and a screw dislocation. In an edge dislocation, the Berger's vector is perpendicular, right? In an edge, your Berger's vector is perpendicular to the direction of your of the line of the dis, of the uh, dislocation in your material, but in a screw dislocation, that Berger's vector is parallel to the dislocation direction d, right? And you can see that here, like this dislocation is running up and down through the material, and so is your Berger's vector. But here, the dislocation is running in this way, and your Berger's vector is just opposite of that; it's orthogonal to that. Okay. And you can see these all around us in nature. I had a stack of Q-tips, uh, and I noticed that sure enough, my Q-tips had a edge dislocation in them. You can see it in, a, in, a, in this corn cob, right? This extra row of atoms. Think about what this does to the atoms, right? The atoms that are on the top side of that dislocation, what do you think that they're experiencing? Well, you crammed in an extra half row of atoms, so they're probably being compressed. Meanwhile, what about the bottom side? On the bottom side, because that extra half row is above it and it's being crammed in there, that's spreading out the bottom ones a little bit more than they would like to be. So they're under tension. So it creates this interesting um, strain field where you've got compression and tension uh, right next to each other, essentially, right? So, and you'll start to see these again everywhere. Like you'll notice that a screw dislocation looks just like a parking garage, right? As you complete the circuit, you end up back where you started, but up one level. So here's a model showing that. So you start out with a regular crystal structure, and then as you start to look at the inner portion, they've made it in blue. Again, looking right at it, it just looks like a regular lattice, but then you start to realize that this has a parking structure sort of way to it, right? Where the only way to make it work is to rotate all the way around, and then you're one level above from where you started. 
So that's a screw dislocation, and that's different from an edge dislocation, which looks more like this, right? You've got these, um, imagine this is just sheets of foam here, right? And you've got this extra sheet that's packed in here in the center, and that creates this region down here, which is now under tension, and this region up here, which is going to be under compression, right? That's a, that would be an example of a edge dislocation. Okay, and of course, uh, it's also possible to have mixed character. It doesn't have to be just screw dislocation or just edge dislocation. It can actually be a mixed character. Here, for example, in this material, which has the same uh, dislocation traveling through it, from one direction, it's a perfect edge dislocation. But if this thing changes direction by 90 degrees over here, it's become a screw dislocation. And somewhere in between, it has a mixed character. So you can have uh, that happening, right? Um, we've already talked about strain. We said that it's under compression up here, under tension down there. And then something that we're going to cover later in a future chapter is that these dislocations are able to move through your lattice and they actually accommodate deformation, right? For example, if you start out with this extra half row of atoms stuffed in right here, and then you shear this material, right? So you're applying a force this way and a force this way. So that's a shear force. What you can do is you can move that dislocation all the way through until it pops out at the end and you achieve deformation. So more on that later.